Good evening, family and friends. How are you doing? You are in for a treat. As Russ mentioned, I'm your moderator for tonight's service. My name is Dr. Maxwell Hill. Our speakers will talk about the impact of nutrition on our health. We will have a Q&A session at the end. Please note that we will not be calling on raised hands. Let me repeat, we will not be calling on raised hands, okay? Please put your questions in the chat, chat box at the bottom. If we don't get around to your questions during service, please send your email address so that the specific speaker can correspond with you. I will not introduce our speakers. Dr. Cara Gill, known as Mackie, outside her professional life, is a medical doctor who attended medical school, residency, and fellowship in New Jersey, where she became a disciple of Jesus Christ as a medical student. She lives with her family and practices primarily adult medicine. She will be sharing briefly on food as medicine. What you eat matters more than you may realize. Hello, I mean, I've had some unhealthy food earlier, so I feel a little bit guilty even reading this thing today. The impact of nutrition on chronic diseases. Next, we're gonna have Pensoa Manly Spain, we all know him as Spain, has been in the fitness industry for 18 years. Spain is passionate, committed, dependable, and has, a, has the qualifications to help his clients achieve and surpass their goals. His qualifications include, but not limited to, NASN certified personal trainer. The brother's been doing this for 17 years. Hello. Corrective exercise specialist, performance enhancement specialization, melt method certified. TRX, man, we can go on and on, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish this because we got to give credit to this brother. Few mass train, stake mobility certified trainers, cycle bar spin instructor, CPR first aid certified. We have great things happening within our ministry, right? Our last speaker, Dr. Toju Chiki Obi, is a board certified pediatrician and is the co founder and medical director of Healthcare Limited. Using broadcast media, social media, and other internet platforms, Health Co's goal is to improve health literacy in Sub-Saharan Africa to promote health and wellness and prevent illnesses. The Health Zoom Wellness Initiative, the NGO arm of Health Core, builds community health capacity among vulnerable groups in Nigeria. Man, you are really in for a treat, okay? I will now pass it on to Dr. Gill to kick us up. Thank you. Thank you, Maxu. I'm going to share my screen now. And um, we don't have a lot of time to share because we wanted to give more time for question and answer. So um, I'm going to provide you some information. Like Maxu said, my title is Food as Medicine. What you eat matters more than what you realize. And um, I'm going to spend a lot, a lot of time tonight talking about the how and the why behind what we are supposed to do. Now, everybody in this audience knows what they are supposed to do. Living in America is on the TV, on the radio. You go to school, your teachers talk about it, health education, you go to your healthcare worker to tell you what you are supposed to do. What I thought I'll do today is to have a little spin and I wanted to go deeper to kind of help you understand the why, why and how you can do the what. So why, why is it important? Why do we keep hearing what we are supposed to do? And I'm gonna talk about the state of affairs, okay? Um, over 30 million people in America have diabetes. Over 58 and a half million Americans are living with arthritis and degenerative joint diseases. Over 160 million Americans have heart disease. Obesity is rampant. Over 142 adult people actually have uh, struggling from obesity, of which 14.7 million are children and adolescents. And it doesn't stop there. 23.5 million people living in America have some form of autoimmune disease, whether it's MS, thyroidism, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac disease, so it's real. Um, over 73 million people suffer from some kind of mood disorders. 
of which 21 uh, million of them have depression in America. And cancers, I mean, the American Cancer Society says that there's an estimate of 1.9 million new cases of cancers every year, with almost about 610 deaths they predicted for 2022. And I haven't even spoken about skin diseases, atopic dermatitis. You know, there are 30 million Americans who are living with some type of atopic dermatitis, whether it's eczema or, you know, some kind of dermatitis that's really an issue. And you know, dermatitis affects quality of life as well as your health. Um, oral health, we'll mention tonight, but Dr. Uh, uh, Maxine Strickland, who was to speak with us tonight, is not able to, she will be doing a video that we're gonna upload on our online library that talks about the impact of oral health. Gum diseases, cavities that go way beyond your mouth. They have been shown to impact heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, adverse birth outcomes, pregnant women who have bad teeth, uh, cavities, poor uh, periodontal health, have adverse birth outcomes, respiratory disease, Alzheimer's, poor oral health, has been linked to dementia, Alzheimer's disease. So the why continues because you know, God's word is amazing. No word of God will ever fail. And I was reading like, you know, two scriptures that jumped up at me. Um, the one Proverbs 14 says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. A peaceful heart when you act, your mind is at ease, You're not no stress because we know that stress directly impacts your health. Um, so it's not just your mental health, but your physical health. And in 3 John 2, where, you know, he talked about how we pray that you may enjoy good health, that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. So very often we tend to focus on, you know, our spirit, how spiritual we are, and we don't understand that God wants us to have good health as well. And so with that, I was, I will really jump into my talk about the gut body access. And it's something that you don't, your doctor doesn't talk to you about often. You don't hear about this often when you watch the news, but it's really huge. And I wanted for us to understand um, the, 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 the beauty and the balance between the gut, your stomach, and your, the rest of your body. The gut mind access is, has been well described and many other things, gut skin um, is so important because what you put in your mouth, what we eat, what we drink, goes into our bodies, get digested. If our microorganisms, the bacteria that live within your large intestines, they are amazingly important because they are the ones that will further break down the foods that you put in your body for your body, your cells to be able to pull them in and feed your, yourself with the nutrients that are in the foods that you eat. So the gut body access is recognized more and more how important it is. The mark is called, you've heard of talk about the gut microbiome, which is just all of the microorganisms that live in your, in your gut, how there has to have a healthy balance. Just think about if you're in a country and you have more of one versus the other, there's always some kind of imbalance. In your body, your gut, the microorganisms that live there are all supposed to be kept in balance. And when one is out of balance, then you have health issues. Your gut lining is built so that when the food comes in, the food is processed and your body absorbs what it needs to absorb where those microorganisms are working and, and, and helping break the food down. And then the nutrients are recognized by the lining of your cell and it gets absorbed through the cell into your bloodstream to the rest of your body to do what it's supposed to do. Well, when there is an issue when you don't, for example, if you don't chew your food too well, you don't break down your food and you, get, you, you, you swallow those big clumps of food, you eat foods that are not healthy for you, what happens is that they can impact the lining of your gut by causing what's called a leaky gut permeability because the cells, instead of the cells being attached close to each other like they are, they begin to get a gap. And so things slide down through this gap 
and get exposed to your bloodstream and your body sees it as the enemy. And what happens is your white blood cells, your immune system kicks into high gear. And what it does is it gets those soldiers that are supposed to fight and defend you, your body against enemies. They get excited and they attack. And what they're doing is they end up causing what's called an increased inflammatory reaction. And so you begin to have your body attacking itself. So more and more studies are showing the benefits of having a healthy gut. A healthy gut leads to a healthy mind, leads to a healthy body. Believe it or not, your, your, the lining of your, your large intestine, your gut, those bacteria allows for your body to break down the things you eat and make more of what's called the happy hormone, your serotonin. Those are neurotransmitters that are in our brain to help our bodies and our minds remain in neutral, stable moves. So your moods can be affected because your gut is unhealthy. Healthy nutrition helps your body um, regenerate itself. It helps what's called angiogenesis. You create new blood vessels that can feed your heart and your organs and also keep your microbiome like I spoke about healthy. So I said here the how, the power lies with us. The bottom line is the power to keep ourselves healthy lies with us. So very simple formula. The goal is to increase whole foods nutrition, increase your intake of water, your physical activity, rest, sleep, healthy relationships, regular check-ins with your healthcare provider, activities that promote good mental health, equity in society, okay, which also has been shown to impact health because, you know, you have food deserts, people don't have financial security. So all those things impact how a person um, uh, is healthy. And decrease and avoid stressful things, avoid heavily processed foods. Heavily processed, processed foods are things like these, you know, um, packaged foods that we eat, um, you know, pre-made uh, waffles and those things, those are heavily processed foods. Those have been shown to affect your body. Decrease alcohol substances, tobacco products, sugary drinks, fried foods, sunburns, those are toxic, exposing yourself to toxins, speed eating where you chew your food two or three times and swallow them, dumping to your guts, those are not good. Um, increase low anti-inflammatory foods in your diet, okay? Just really stay away from animal um, milk. We'll talk about that more in the question and answer, I'm sure. But just really focusing on foods to eat to decrease your inflammation in your body. And a summary is a colorful plate is a starting point. If your plate is very colorful, that means your food, the variety of foods that you're eating. We've been encouraged to eat um, four to nine helpings of fruits and vegetables a day. And only 10% of Americans do that. We don't eat healthily. Um, our plate is supposed to be colorful. We are encouraged to take in 30 different kinds of vegetables in a week. So we have, if you take five different kinds of vegetables a day, you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you can get that variety in your meal. So I just put on this slide a quick synopsis of things, you know, Omega-3s, you want to increase your omega-3s, wild-caught fatty fish, salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines, your beans, your legumes, country rice, not processed rice, kimchi, uh, legumes, oats, dandelion greens. You want to take your berries, your, your tangerines, your currants, your spinach, kale, collard greens, oregano, special flowers, spices are important, um, dark chocolate for those who are chocolate lovers, Plant-based um, milk and cheese, water, enough water, and green teas have been shown to be beneficial. This is a quick example of a healthy plate. This is actually my breakfast on a Saturday morning. I've got, you know, um, purple sweet potatoes, which have very high uh, antioxidants, some blueberries, and a mixture of eggs with mushrooms and um, tomatoes and onions and scallions and, you know, um, garlic, all mixed up. And an example of what, how you should shop, what did you have in your house? You know, forget about the heavily processed foods, have some kimchi, some carrots, some um, kale, um, you know, zucchini, your fruits and your vegetables and your nuts. Don't forget your nuts. Thank you and I'll take questions at the end.
I'll pass this on now to, to Sting. What is up, family? That was amazing, actually. It's funny. I was talking to a client today about gut health. That is a huge thing to um, research for everyone. So thank you so much for that. That was incredible. So we're talking about food, right? Nutrition in the body. So I just want to give you guys some things to think about, right? So obviously we're all here because collectively we've all eaten a whole bunch of food. Like we're all here because we're, we're doing pretty good in that area, right? Some a little more than others, but <laughs> so, so it is. But food is, food is one of those things, right? It's a lifelong battle. So you have to establish that just like your spirituality, there's ups and downs, right? Um, it's a lifelong journey. But the only way to get better at eating is educating yourself. The only way to get spiritually is living and applying and having a community to support you. And food is sort of the same way. You need, it's, a, it's not something you can conquer by yourself, right? It's not something um, that is easy, you know, because of so many factors, right? So, I mean, so basically, the first thing is, what is food? I don't know if we think about that, but what is food intended for, right? What is the reason we eat? It's so that it helps two things. It helps us develop and grow. Bottom line is food is something that helps us grow. That's the reason why we do it. Why do we eat? We eat when we're, we feel hungry. Um, we eat when we, some of us are, eat when we're emotional. Some of us eat, you know, very inconsistently and radically, right? So there are reasons uh, those things exist. But this is what I've learned in my years in the industry, working with nutritionists, health coaches, dietitians. There's, there's nothing about rich and poor. I know the wealthiest people that have the biggest challenge with eating food. So sometimes we just think, well, if I had the resources, I would eat better. That is also a myth. Yes, it could help you. But the truth is, rich, poor, in between, it doesn't matter. It's a lifelong journey because a lot of it is psychological. Some of it is just the way we were brought up. Some of us were raised to eat very cultural, nutritious food. Uh, everything was fried. Your palates developed this feeling for a certain type of food or grow up eating pizza so, or whatever it is. It could be any specific food. It's an emotional conditioned behavior. It's patterns that we've developed over years. You had no control when you were a kid, how your parents raised you and what they fed you, or if you didn't have that experience. So food is a, it's, it's a tough thing because some of it for us, it's, it connects us back to our longing or a past or what we're comfortable with, right? So it becomes this thing that is such a battle because we feel like if we don't eat this thing, it doesn't make me feel good. So a lot of us eat for feeling, for feeling good. But here's the problem. A lot of us don't feel great, but we eat the same things that we eat over time and we get into a position that we get comfortable with being uncomfortable and not feeling good. So it becomes what we are. So we, we, we live in that state of, I don't feel good, but you know what? So, so be it. I'm just going to continue doing what we're doing. And it becomes who we are. So that eating becomes part of your DNA, becomes part of you. And, it's, and, and it takes a lot to draw from and to work on. Um, you don't want to be helpless about it you you, you want to be uh understand that there's always a possibility of growth and change but it takes a lot of work you don't want to stress about it because you don't want to beat yourself up about food but the truth is i always tell people as good as i am as a trainer or someone who helps coach people to fitness 85 percent of it is, is nutrition everything else i do is enhance what you're putting into your body I can help you build muscle, make you run faster, play a sport, live better, feel better. But 85% of that is nutrition. If your nutrition is off base, I can't, you can't outrun a fork, what you put in your mouth. You just can't. I mean, so what you're consuming either supports what I do or it is what it is. You're just going to be living in that world of frustration, right? So it's just learning pat patterns, how to feed my metabolism. Some days it's just learning also that I just, I can't eat for taste all the time. You know, I just can't eat because it tastes good. That is, you know, uh, it's just not a, a good place to, you know, why won't you eat metal? Or why won't you eat rocks? Or why won't you eat any of that stuff, right? We know specific things that we consume and they're harmful to our body, but 
we kind of dismiss the bad things we eat because we think, ah, we're okay. But we don't, we, we don't really understand what it's affecting, how it's affecting our body with inflammation. Some of it, what it's causing to our hearts, our organs, and how it's just not helping us feel well. We, some of us just don't, we don't feel good. We're not sleeping well. We have too much caffeine. We don't eat consistently. All those things play a role, right? But it starts with saying, here's what I've learned also. I, I read an amazing quote. To, to work through something or to come to a point of understanding where you are, you have to at some point take ownership for your role in where you are. You have to then say, okay, blah, 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 all these other factors, but I need to take ownership and say, you know what, enough of the excuses. There's, if I want to make a change, I have to make a change. Change the way you think, educate yourself some more, find a community, and just put some things in place. You know, in Ephesians 4.11, yeah, he just talks about how um, we're all given different abilities and skills to help the body of Christ mature. Now, I can speak from a point of strength when it comes to this area because it's a strength of mine. It's something I've lived in, and I'm someone who consumes food more for its purpose of me being as efficient as possible. Some days I may not, I don't eat because it tastes good. I eat because I know that it's a fuel that I want. I want to put the right fuels in my body because I, I look at it in that manner. I want to feed my body the right proper fuels. And I think sometimes it's okay to eat for pleasure. It's okay to indulge, but you have to understand the effects of it. And you have to understand what that can do for one. There are people who don't exercise or work out or do any of that. And they eat that way anyway. That's a whole nother journey. And there are people who are working out specifically, they want to get better, but they still haven't kind of honed in on where they want to be with nutrition. So that's a challenge and they get frustrated. I have a lot of clients of mine that beat themselves up every day. My job is to encourage them. We can spend an hour, four to five days a week in the gym. But if what you're consuming goes against what we're working on or what we're doing, the partnership does not agree and you'll never get your results. Now, I'll help you move better, but you're going to be frustrated with your results and what's going to end up happening. You increase stress. You lose hope, you lose belief, you start thinking that exercise doesn't work and it's a vicious cycle. And then what you do, you just kind of give up. And then people just get into this state of just paralysis of analysis, as they say, just sitting, accepting what you are. So my encouragement is this, also try and avoid and get rid of and destroy limiting beliefs. I am an African male, grew up in West Africa. I've been fed red meat my entire life. At some point, I decided I am not doing that anymore because I educated myself and realized that it is not a function of good inflammation in my body, and I removed it. If you told me four years ago to not eat red meat, we would not be friends. It's just not something I would do, <laughs> all right? You know, some of you, if I tell you don't ever eat pizza again, you would get off of Zoom. <laughs> you would just get off the call, right? But get rid of those limiting beliefs. Stop telling yourself, I can never stop doing this. I can't stop drinking coffee. I can't stop, you know, whatever it is. Destroy it. You have to say with the power of Christ, I can achieve anything I want to achieve with God's help and with education and knowledge. And you have to have that belief, regardless of your upbringing and regardless of what you've had in your past. So my encouragement to you, it's a lifelong journey. It's easier for some, harder for others. Learn, educate yourself. There are things that are very, very harmful that we saw before, but there are things that are very, very good. There's some things now that are created that can help your life. Instead of deep frying everything, there are air fryers now, there are options. There's so many things out there now that can make your foods that you are used to eating a lot healthier and a lot more nutritious and not more beneficial for you. So you can feel better. Hopefully, if God gives you the strength to live for another 50 years or more or whatever, that you're waking up and you're optimizing this amazing engine and body that God has given you um, to, to walk on this earth. And it'll just help you be a more positive and, and, and exciting person. You'll have a lot more energy, um, hopefully. Um, and it just it's just tremendous. So I love you guys. Um, just food for thought, soul food, not literally soul food, but, you know, food for your soul. That was awesome, Spain. Thank you so very much. 
So hi, everyone. This has been amazing. Um, uh, Mackie and Spain, you guys were incredible. You took a lot of my thunder, but that's okay. I'm focusing on kids, so we're just going to slug through this. So um, why healthy eating is important for children? Why is it so important? Children are building bodies, right, that will carry them for the rest of their lives. The pattern that they develop now when they're young will be the pattern that they continue when they grow old. I'm going to quote the scripture, Proverbs 22, 6, train a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. The same applies to healthy eating for children. Train a child in the way they should eat. And when they are old, they will not turn from it. Spain just spoke so eloquently about that how hard it is for us to break our patterns as adults that we learned from our childhood. So I'm gonna ask you some questions about eating behaviors in young people. Do you know that most kids do not meet their fruit and vegetable recommendations? You can pat yourself on the back and say, yeah, I knew that. Do you know that most kids do not consume the recommended amount of water that they should? Yeah, I bet you knew that too. Do you know that Empty calories from added sugars and solid fats contribute to 40%. That's almost 50%, almost half of what our children and adolescents age two through 18 eat. And it affects the quality of their health. As Mackie and Spain talked about, foods can harm, okay? Foods can harm. So I'm gonna quote this. I, I read this and I just thought it was incredible. This is by Dr. Carla Lester. And she said, we are battling unhealthy and overwhelming forces like sugary foods, which produce a dopamine zinc to the brain, screen time and its tendency to create process addictions, digital neuromarketing tactics that create over desire for processed foods, not to mention the harms of social media, cyberbullying and Instagram fake wellness perfection, which embeds negative body image in our teens at every turn. Our children are dealing with a lot. So how do we fight back to help our kids stay healthy? I recommend using a holistic approach to child nutrition. And what I mean by that is an approach that doesn't just focus on what they eat, but also how they feel about themselves and how they respond to and interact with the influences such as social media, peer pressure, even your family dynamics and aggressive food industry marketing. Try to create a culture in your home of openness, healthy eating, physical activity, and fitness. As parents, it is crucial that we model this ourselves for our children. There will be enormous benefits to the family's physical and mental health if you could just do that. I wanna at this point go ahead to say that if you have difficulty getting sufficient food for yourself or your family, Assistance is available through the church, locally in your community, and through federally funded programs such as SNAP, which is the old food stamps. I work closely with the Community Food Bank of New Jersey and can connect you to resources if you want to contact me privately. Because I, we don't want to be naive to think every, that those amongst us who do not suffer from food insecurity. Having said that, you can eat a healthy diet even on a limited budget. Nutrition for kids is based on the same principles as nutrition for adults. Everyone needs the same kind of nutrients. Vitamins, the six, the, the six main things we all need. Vitamins, minerals, carbs, protein, fiber, water. Children, however, need different amounts of specific nutrients at different ages. So first I'll just speak in broad terms, all right? And then I will narrow things down and speak very briefly on the different age groups, okay? So Mackie touched on this already, but I'm putting it up again. For proteins, 
lean meat and poultry, eggs, beans, peas, soy products, and unsalted nuts and seeds. I want to give a special shout out to beans. Beans are a powerhouse and often get a bad rap because of you know what. But beans are loaded with protein. They're loaded with fiber. They're loaded with good carbs. Grains, whole grains, whole wheat bread, corn tortillas, oatmeal, popcorn, quinoa, brown or wild rice. Limit, like Mackie said, limit refined grains, white bread, pasta and rice. If you must eat them because you prefer their taste, choose the enriched kinds. Even in the stores now, there's protein fortified pasta. You know, so try and go for as healthy a version as you can. Eat a variety of fresh fruits, but you can go with canned if that's what your, your, your budget allows. You could go with frozen or dried foods. Just remember, if you go with canned foods, make sure it says light or it says in, canned in its own juice. That means there's very little sugar added. Serve fresh, canned, frozen, or dried vegetables, including every color under the, the sun. You saw Mackie's wonderfully colorful plate. Dark green, red, orange, beans, peas. Cover everything, as many different vegetables every week. And if you're selecting canned or frozen, again, look out for low sodium options because the canned ones generally have a, a bit of salt. So look for low sodium options. For dairy, only fat-free or low-fat dairy products if you eat dairy. I'm not going to go into that. We'll answer. I know we'll address that in the uh, Q&A. Milk, yogurt, cheese, or fortified soy beverages. I will say one thing, and I want you to listen very carefully. No one over the age of two years old should be drinking whole milk. No one. We can talk later. Fats. Use vegetable and not oils, okay? Limit saturated and trans fats, okay? We could, again, I'm sure we'll have questions about that in the Q&A. So, but the one thing I will recommend, I will say on this issue is, in general, teach yourself to read labels, okay? To read labels so that you can avoid buying foods that have added sugar, that have saturated and trans fats, and that are high in sodium, all right? So now I want to talk about liquids that our kids take, all right? Fluid intake, especially juice and sugar sweetened beverages have gone through the roof for our kids and contribute greatly to childhood obesity. Children should be encouraged to drink milk and water and limit 100% juice. In general, children should avoid drinking flavored milks, toddler formulas, Plant milks, except in certain age groups and in certain circumstances, sugar sweetened drinks, caffeinated drinks, or artificial sweetened beverages. Start at a young age to make sure that your children are drinking just milk and water. It helps establish their taste preferences and encourages healthy habits. Infants from zero to six months of age should drink only breast milk. And if, it's, if not breast milk, then formula. Water in a cup can be introduced at six months or so. And then at 12 months, they can transition to whole milk for a brief period of time. Milk is an important component of a healthy diet for most children, as it is an excellent source of calcium, vitamins A and D, zinc and energy. However, total milk intake should be modified. You can see on this screen, if you know what, if your children fall into any of these age groups, please take note how much water and how much milk is recommended. Your child, no child should be drinking more than 20 ounces. No two to five year old should be drinking more than 20 ounces of milk a day for no reason, okay? Particularly if it's being consumed to the exclusion of eating other healthy foods, all right? So this I'm gonna put up here, Again, Mackie already showed us an amazing picture of her plate. I will just add quality foods only, healthy portion sizes, avoid letting your kids take seconds as much as possible. Eat half your grains, make, make half your grains whole grains, okay? Now we're just gonna 
quickly go zip through the different age groups, okay? For babies, it's all about milk, whether it's breast milk or formula or a combination of both. It provides, breast milk or formula provides practically every nutrient a baby needs for their first year of life. At about six months, they are ready to start solid foods for some babies like iron fortified infant cereals, strained fruits, vegetables, pureed meats. Particularly for breastfed babies, sometimes breast milk can be low in certain vitamins, you know, in, a, in vitamin D, can be low in zinc, okay? And so it's a good idea to, you know, begin to give off a, um, a solid foods around that six to nine month age. Once you start adding foods though, for inf babies, don't go low fat crazy. Babies need their fat. You don't want to restrict fats at this age, under age two, because a healthy amount of fat is important for their brain and nerve, central nervous system to develop well, okay? Toddlers and preschoolers, my favorite age. They grow in spurts and their appetites come and go in spurts, okay? They may eat a lot today and eat zero for the next two days. That is normal. As long as you offer them a healthy selection, they will get what they need. Calcium is needed to develop strong, healthy bones and milk, unfortunately, as much as it gets a bad rap, is the, is the best source of much needed calcium for them at this age. Fiber, your chicken, your kids may want chicken nuggets, fries and macaroni, but they need fiber. Who has dealt with a constipated toddler? It is a nightmare. Please give, encourage vegetables and fruits. Encourage a habit of snacking on vegetables and fruit. And at this age, beware of creating unhealthy snack habits. You have your four-year-old who hasn't eaten in three days, barely anything. So you give her a Cheeto and behold, she eats the whole bag. So you give more Cheetos. No, let is, this is the age where parents fall into the trap of creating an unhealthy snack habit. Don't do it. Let your snacking be fruits and vegetables. The baby carrots, a little, uh, a handful of, of, of strawberries, healthy snacking, even raisins are better than eating a bag of Cheetos at this age. Great schoolers, at this age, you watch out for sugars, fats, and sodium. They're going to school now, they're going to the cafeteria, they have more choice in what they eat, all right? So uh, teach them everything should be eaten in moderation so that, because you don't want them to gain unneeded weight and eat unhealthy foods in the cafeteria. Preferably pack your child's lunch with healthy appetizing food or go over their school lunch menu together with your child and encourage him or her to select healthier choices. It sounds easier than it is in real life, but go for it anyway, try, okay? Preteens and teens, puberty kicks in, so they need calories to support the many changes their bodies will go through. But beware of those calories coming from fast food and junk foods. At the same time, some adolescents do the opposite. They restrict calories, fats, and carbs. Because in adolescence, kids become conscious of their weight and body image, which for some can lead to eating disorders and other unhealthy behaviors. So be aware of changes in your child's eating patterns and make family dinners a priority at least a couple of times a week because then you can actually see what they're eating and what they're not eating, okay? Preteens and teens also require tremendous amounts of calcium because the majority of bone mass is built at this time. So encourage milk and milk products or other calcium rich alternatives to help them get more calcium. And as an, a side note, teen girls need more iron that their male, than their male counterparts to replace what is lost during their menstruation, while males need a bit more protein for the building of the larger muscle mass that they have. In conclusion, although getting your child to eat healthy, regardless of his or her age, can be a constant battle, it is one well worth fighting. A healthy child becomes a healthy adult, and only with your support and guidance will your child be both. Thank you for your attention.